We are now going to hear the greatest sermon ever preached. I am going to preach the greatest sermon you will ever hear. Because I'm going to preach the message which Jesus of Nazareth preached 2,000 years ago on the mountain near the shore of the Sea of Galilee, the message that we call the Sermon on the Mount. As Chris argued last Sunday, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives us a blueprint for true human living. In the Sermon on the Mount, we have a map for flourishing humanity. In the Sermon on the Mount, the one who made us tells us how he made us to live. Now, Matthew, the former tax collector who records the Sermon on the Mount, tells us that Jesus preached this in Galilee. Quoting from the prophet Isaiah, Matthew says that he preached it in Galilee of the Gentiles. Matthew says that after John the Baptist, John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus, that after John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, quote, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan River, Galilee of the Gentiles, or as it can be rendered, uh, Galilee of the nations. Now, why preach what turns out to be the most influential sermon ever preached in Galilee? Why not preach it in the influential city of Jerusalem? Because of Galilee's location. It was on a major trade route that came from Damascus of Syria all the way down to Egypt. Jerusalem was not on that trade route. The route is called the Way of the Sea, which means that like Vancouver, people from many parts of the world would travel through Galilee and some of them actually making it their home bringing with them all their philosophical and religious ideas and practices, which made those down in Jerusalem very suspicious of the people in Galilee. Before the second century BC, for 500 years, people thought of Galilee as a pagan land. Galilee was therefore, like Vancouver, a multicultural, multi-religious place. It's just the kind of place in which Jesus likes to preach. There were about 10 thriving towns in Galilee, towns like Capernaum and Tiberias, and there were 200 villages. The Jewish historian Josephus says that none of those 200 villages had less than 15,000 people. A lot of people. This was more densely populated than Jerusalem and its surroundings. New Testament scholar George, uh, 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 Michael Green can say, Jesus began his work in the most densely populated area he could have found anywhere in the Middle East. And in that area, light began to break into the darkness. Again, quoting the prophet Isaiah, Matthew says that when Jesus came into the Gentile of the nation, Galilee of the nations, the people who were sitting in darkness saw great light. Upon those who were sitting in the shadow and land of death, a light dawned. And that's what we're praying for for our city at our time, that light break through the darkness that life break through the death, and that light turns out to be Jesus. Now, into the darkness and death, Jesus then preaches his gospel. Matthew 4, 17. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. That is the gospel according to Jesus of Nazareth. Repent. For the kingdom of God has come near. What was thought to only come at the end of time is now spilling into the present. Heaven is invading the earth. Jesus then began to call people to follow him as teacher, as master, as king, inviting them into relationship with him so that they might become kingdom people. To form communities of the king right there in the midst of all that multicultural religious context. 
And Matthew says that Jesus then began to heal people of all kinds of ailments, not to prove that his kingdom is breaking into the world, but because the kingdom breaking into the world is all about human beings made whole. Now, the light begins to shine so brightly that the word about Jesus spread fast and far, which is what we pray happens in our time. Matthew tells us in 425 that great multitudes followed Jesus from Galilee, from Decapolis, from Jerusalem, and beyond the Jordan. And it is then that Jesus preaches his most influential sermon. Oh, one more thing. Galilee that time was under the rule of Rome. The people were under foreign occupation forces. Roman soldiers were everywhere, sent there to keep the peace, a very different kind of peace, a peace won by a sword and enforced by a sword. And Galilee was under the rule of Herod Antipas, who was one of the sons of Herod the Great. He was under Roman rule, but he had a certain amount of authority. It was Herod Antipas who had John the Baptist arrested because John dared to challenge Herod's morality. Herod had so lusted after his brother's wife that he took her as his own wife, and John dared to challenge that great ruler about his transgression of the law of God. In that densely populated, multi-everything place, under foreign domination, ruled by an ambitious, cruel puppet leader, Jesus, the world's true sovereign, gives what I like to call his throne speech. It's in Matthew chapters 5 through 6. Matthew 5 verse 1. And when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. His sermon starts very low. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for right-relatedness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you. When people insult you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you on account of me, rejoice and be glad, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt should lose its tastiness, how can the salt be restored again? It cannot. It's good for nothing but to be thrown out on the street and trampled underfoot by people. You, 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 you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. People don't light a lamp and then put a basket over it. No, they light a lamp and put it on the stand so that it gives light to all in the room. You, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, do not think that I came to abolish the law and the prophets. I did not come to abolish. I came to fulfill. 
For I truly, I say to you, that until heaven and earth, unless, until heaven and earth pass away, not the slightest letter or stroke of the law will pass away until all is fulfilled. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches these commandments will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. I think we have a slide. That's Matthew 5.20. I want you to see that verse again. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You'll see that there are three righteousnesses, if so to speak. Your righteousness, the righteousness of the scribes, and the righteousness of the Pharisees. In the rest of the sermon now, Jesus will compare your righteousness, disciples' righteousness, with the, with the righteousness of the scribes, and then with the righteousness of the Pharisees. He's going to show how your righteousness is superior to the scribes in his six, you have heard it was said, but I say unto you. He's going to show how your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees in the three, do not practice your righteousness to be seen by men. And then at 619, he starts into, into your righteousness with do not treasure treasures on earth. Okay, so he continues. You have heard that it was said, you shall not murder. And whoever murders is liable to the court. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother or sister is liable to the court. Whoever says to, says to his brother or sister, Raka, you blockhead, shall be guilty to the Supreme Court. And whoever says to his brother or sister, you fool, shall be guilty enough to be thrown into the fires of hell. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, first go be reconciled to your brother and sister and then come back and offer your, your present, you pre present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at, at law lest your opponent turn you over to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, the officer throw you into jail. I tell you the truth, you're, you're going to stay in jail until you pay up every cent. You have heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever lusts after a woman has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if your right eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out, throw it away. It's better that one part of your body perish than that your whole body go into the fires of hell. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better that one part of your body perish than that your whole body go into hell. You have heard it was said, whoever sends away his wife, give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife except for the cause of unchastity causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries such a divorced woman commits adultery. You have heard it was said, you shall make no false vows and you shall keep your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all. No oath at all. Either by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is its footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Make no oath by your head. You cannot change your, make any hair white or black. Instead, let your yes be yes, and your no be no. Anything more than that is of the evil one. You have heard it was said, Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. Whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other. Whoever wants to sue you for your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Whoever asks of you, 
give to whoever asks of you, and do not refuse the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you might be children of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes the sun to shine on the evil and the good, and he sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? I mean, do not even tax collectors do that? And if you only greet those who greet you, what more are you doing than others? Do not the unbelieving Gentiles do that? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, beware of practicing your righteousness before others in order to be seen by them. When you present alms, uh, do not sound the trumpet as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets in order that they might be seen by others as giving alms. I tell you, they have their reward in full. They've been seen by others. Big deal. When you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your alms are given in secret and your Father who sees in secret will repay you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. They love to pray in the synagogues and stand on the corners in order to be seen by others as praying. I tell you the truth, they have their reward in full. They've been seen by others as praying. Big deal. (laughs) But when you pray... Go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will repay you. And when you pray, do not use meaningless repetition as the unbelieving Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. Your Father knows what you need before you ask. When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven... Your name be hallowed on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but rescue us from the evil one, Father. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. If you forgive others their transgressions, your Father will forgive your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, your Father will not forgive your transgressions. And when you fast, when you fast, do not put on a gloomy face like the hypocrites do. They ignore their appearance in order to be seen by others as fasting. I tell you, they have their reward in full. Others see them as fasting. But you, anoint your head, wash your face, so that you will not be seen by others as fasting, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will repay you. Do not treasure treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But treasure treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves cannot break in, steal, in, 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 break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Earth or heaven. The lamp of the body is the eye. If the eye is clear, the body will be full of light. But if the eye is bad, the body will be full of darkness. And if the light in you becomes darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters. You'll either love the one and hate the other or despise the one other and be loyal to the other. You cannot. Serve God and mammon. Notice how I put that. I did not say you should not serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and mammon. For this reason, 
stop being anxious about your life, about what you shall eat and what you shall drink and what you shall put on. It's not, it's not life more than food. And is not the body more than clothing? Uh, look at the birds of the look at the birds of the air. Uh, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth more than they to your Father? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubit, eighteen inches, to your lifespan? And and, and why do you? worry about clothing start looking at the lilies of the field they do not sow they do not uh, sow or spin they do not can't, 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 can't remember the line you know what I'm talking about <laughs> they neither toil nor spin there you go Yet not even Solomon in all of his glory was arrayed as one of these. If God so arrays the grass, which is here today, but thrown in the furnace tomorrow, will he not take care of you, oh, you little faith ones? So don't worry asking what shall we eat, what shall we drink, with what shall we clothe ourselves. The unbelieving Gentiles seek those things all day long. Your father knows what you need. You seek first the kingdom and righteousness of God, and all these things will be added to you. So stop worrying about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Today has enough trouble of its own. Do not judge, lest you be judged. For in the way that you judge, you will be judged. The measure that is used, the measure that you use is the measure that will be used on you. And why do you pay attention to the speck that is in your brother or sister's eye and, and do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother and sister, here, let me take the speck out of your eye when you don't see this big log in your own eye? You're being a hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye and then you might see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs. Do not cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under feet and their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened. For whoever is asking is receiving. Whoever is seeking is finding. To the one who is knocking, the door will be opened. Now, what parent among you has a child ask for a loaf of bread and you give him a stone? Or the child asks for a fish and you give him a snake? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give what is good to those who ask him? Therefore, however you want to be treated, so treat others. This is the law and the prophets. Be careful to enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And many are on it. But the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life and few are those who find it. Beware of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes do not come from thorns, do they? Figs do not come from thistles, do they? A good tree bears good fruit. A bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree does not bear bad fruit, and a bad tree does not bear good fruit. Any tree that bears bad fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So, you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. 
On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do miracles in your name? And I will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawless ones. Therefore, whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice can be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. The rains came down, the floods came up, the winds blew against that house, but it stood because it was on the rock. Whoever hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice can be compared to a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. The rains came down, the floods came up, the winds blew against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. After Jesus finished preaching his sermon, Matthew tells us, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. How in the world are we going to live what we just heard? <laughs> Let me just say three things. We'll learn more as we go through this series on the Sermon on the Mount. How in the world are we supposed to live this Sermon on the Mount? First, never separate the Sermon on the Mount from Jesus' gospel. You must keep Jesus' sermon connected to Jesus' gospel. His gospel again, Matthew 4, 17, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This sermon can only be lived if we are experiencing the life of the kingdom of God. It's like your iPhone. It does not work unless it's connected to the internet. <laughs> we cannot live this sermon unless it's connected to to the kingdom. Without this connection, the sermon either becomes frustrating idealism or crushing legalism. Do not separate the sermon from the kingdom. And we'll say more about that later. Second thing, let me just comment on a text that probably disturbed you. Many texts did, but this one. It's Matthew 4, 548. Therefore, I say to you, that you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. I grew up hearing the Sermon on the Mount in the King James Version, and that was, be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Holy moly. What a command. You are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. I have good news for you about Matthew 5, 48. It is not a command. It is a promise. The original is hard to render into English. For those of you who know Greek, it's the future imperative. And that is hard to translate into English. But without going into a lot of detail, let me tell you that it is not a command. It is a promise. You are going to be... You, that, it, how, what do you have up there in front of you? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. It should be rendered, you're going to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Isn't that good news? Here, C.S. Lewis helps us. I'm reading from a section of his Mere Christianity. Mere Christianity is a book he wrote last century, and it's a collection of his radio broadcasts. And he writes, I find a good many people have been bothered by what I said in the previous chapter about our Lord's words, be perfect. Some people seem to think this means, unless you are perfect, I will not help you. And as we cannot be perfect, then if he meant that, our position is hopeless. But I do not think he meant that. I think he meant the only help I will give you is the help to become perfect. You may want something less, but I will give you nothing less. Well, then he says, let me explain. When I was a child, I often had a toothache, and I knew that if I went to my mother, she would give me something that would deaden the pain for the night and then let me go to sleep. But I did not go to my mother, at least not until the pain became very bad. And the reason I did not go was this. 
I did not doubt she would give me my, the aspirin, but I knew she would do something else. I knew she'd take me to the dentist the next morning. I could not get what I wanted out of her without getting something more which I did not want. I wanted immediate relief from pain, but I could not get it without having my teeth set permanently right. And I knew those dentists. I knew they started fiddling about with all sorts of other teeth which had not yet begun to ache. They would not let sleeping dogs lie. If you gave them an inch, they gave you a mile. Now, if I may put it this way, our Lord is like dentists. If you give him an inch, he will take a mile. Dozens of people go to him to be cured of some particular sin of which they're ashamed or which is obviously spoiling daily life. Well, he will cure it all right, but he will not stop there. That may be all you asked, but if once you call him in, he will give you the full treatment. This is why he warned people to count the cost before becoming Christians. Make no mistake, he said, if you let me, I will make you perfect. The moment you put yourself in my hands, that is what you are in for. Nothing less or other than that. You have free will, and if you choose, you can push me away. But if, but if you do not push me away, understand that I'm going to see this job through. Whatever suffering it may cost you in your earthly life, whatever can, inconceivable purification it may cost you after death, whatever it costs me, I will never rest nor let you rest until you are literally perfect, until my Father can say without reservation that he's well pleased with you as he said he was well pleased with me. This I can do and will do, but I will do. Nothing less. You are going to be perfect like your heavenly father. Now, what's our role in that? One more thing, then we're done. Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I'm going to suggest to you that this is the one command that is undergirding all the other commands. If we will follow this one command and live this one command, we'll be able to do the other commands. Seek first the kingdom and righteousness of God. Now, there's no kingdom without a king. So I think we can translate that. Seek first the king. Do everything. Do everything to seek first the king, to follow Jesus the king, to get in step with Jesus the king, to get as close to Jesus as you can, to live the life of the king, to let the king live his life in you, to pay attention to the king, to do everything you can to stay right on the heels of this great king. And when we do, we'll find ourselves living this grand blueprint for a flourishing human life. To him be all the glory, now and forevermore. Amen.